up to something this morning. Since you're already standing, remain standing. Let us go to the word of the Lord. I have two passages of scripture that I pray that I can weave together and put it all in its proper context so that we can have a revelation of God and an understanding of our times and most importantly, an understanding of what our God is doing. Second Kings verse 19, verses 29 through 31. And then I'm going to go to Second Chronicles, chapter 32, verses 7 and 8. It's not a lot of scriptures. Just have to work your word a little bit. And if you can't find Second Kings, it's right after First Kings. <laughs> Second Kings 19, verses 29 through 31. I want to read this from the NIV. The word of God says this. This will be a sign for you, Hezekiah. Watch this. This year, you will eat what grows by itself. And in the second year, what springs from that? But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. Hmm. I want to read that again because I, I don't want you to miss the acceleration in this text. This year you will eat what grows by itself. That means you didn't do nothing, you just, you just ate it. And then in the second year, you're going, to, you're going to eat what springs from that. So the fruit that was in the seed that was inside of the fruit that you just ate, you're going to also eat from. But in the third year, you're going to have to sow and reap, <laughs> plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. Hmm. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of God, of Judah, will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant. And out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. Whew. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Very quickly, Second Chronicles 32, verses 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. For the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is the arm of the flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Father, we thank you for this moment, this divine encounter to hear a word from you. Speak to us like only you can. Give us a right now word. A word that doesn't change some things, but a word that changes everything. As the word comes forth, Father, let us be conformed to the image of your Son. Transformed by the renewing of our minds. Touch our hearts so it's open to receive that word and on our ears that we're able to hear it. I have one selfish prayer request today that no one, including myself, leaves this place the way they came, but that we are all changed by your power. In Jesus' name, if you agree, shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Beloved, for the next few moments we have together, I want to preach to you from the subject entitled Band of Survivors. It was in 2010, that a New York Daily News editorial read these words. So suddenly, there they were, vigorous and exultant, and newly thankful for the privilege of walking atop of God's orb. I love how 
the journalist captures this moment and this narrative because he opens up by not burying the lead. Meaning in journalism, it's a very important thing that when you're telling a story or a narrative, just tell people what's going on. Don't, let, don't make them dig out what's happening because if they do, they'll get bored and they'll walk away because they don't feel like reading all the way down to find out what happened. And so it's almost like a spoiler alert to let, to let everybody know what the story is going to be about. And so he writes the words, so suddenly there they were, vigorous and exultant and newly thankful for the privilege of walking atop God's orb. In other words, he's letting us know from the jump that whatever happened, somebody made it out. And with that understanding, we have to realize then that he's talking about something that happened back in 2010, a year, a little while ago, and it was a story that captured the globe and the world and everybody was watching. 33 Chilean miners were, were trapped in northern uh, Chile as they were digging through a mine and the rocks collapsed on the inside of them and all of a sudden they were trapped. Seemingly all hope was lost and individuals of their family members and their community and their loved ones thought that these men were dead. Instead of buying into that narrative, they decided that they were going to make a makeshift tent community and camp out every day at the site among which they thought the men were dead. They even had the audacity to name the camp tent site and they called it Camp Hope. As a matter of fact, every day they would start to have normal affairs that a community would have. Their children would show up. They would begin to educate them right there. They would feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner right at the same spot. Nobody left this campsite until they heard the word of some sort of semblance that their loved ones, the men that were trapped, were still alive. And all of a sudden, it, it wasn't until uh, 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 17 days later, can you imagine not knowing if the first person that you love was actually alive? Which each day you would have to imagine that, that, that hope would diminish. Each day, the thoughts and the odds of rescuing the men had to diminish over that period of time. But 17 days later, they found something out as one of the engineers would begin to drill down with a drill bit to see if they could make a hole down into the depths of where the men were, they discovered something very peculiar when they pulled the drill bit back out. And what they discovered was there was a note attached to the drill bit in duct tape. And here's what the note said, we are all alive. Just for a run through, as a spoiler alert to this message, can you do a preacher a favor and just look down your row and say, everybody I'm attached to is going to make it out alive. If the person next to you didn't give you any real response, if, if they didn't move or say anything or, or even give an inkling that they cared, just find somebody else and tell them everybody I'm attached to is going to make it out. Yeah. That means my kids, my wife, my husband, my grandma and them, my auntie, my cousin, every, everybody I'm attached Oh, God, I feel the noise. Everybody I'm attached to. Meanwhile, experts from around the world offered to help. They brought in drilling specialists and dug exploratory holes through thousands of feet of dense rock, and crews worked tirelessly to find some sign of how they were going to get the men out because the truth be told, it was great that they were alive, but the problem was is how are you going to get out? It's one thing to be uh, uh, in, in survival mode. It's one thing to survive, but it's another thing to make it out completely. They were all aware of the obstacles and the, un, uh, and the unwillingness to, to give up on the trapped souls below. Uh, uh, for more than two weeks, miners 
Minus, if you will, uh, uh, allow their fate to remain unknown. But, but on that 17th day, they realized this is a miracle. There's no way that everybody should be alive. All 33 of the men were there and in good condition. Now the goal was to keep them alive until they returned to the top of the surface. The miners had survived, but they remained at risk. The reason they remained at risk is because all around them were impediments of stone and rock and debris that could collapse on them at any time. On top of that, how are they going to survive for the length of what it was going to take because they were told that it was going to take four months to get them out. Four months of no food. Four months of no water. Four months of no sustenance. Four months of surviving on all you got left. Whatever you got down there is all you got. It is the only resources that you have, and they could not put resources down into the hole because they could not risk the rocks falling down on them. And so while you're, they're working feverishly at the top, there has to be a strategy at the bottom to make sure that despite the trauma and despite the suffering that we had endured for these 17 days, there's an opportunity for us to make it out. And so they had to realize then that they had to be proactive and take a proactive stance and more importantly, make sure their perception was intact day by day by day by day. So one miner emerged as a leader and decided to encourage the rest of them, letting them know each day, we're gonna to have to ration our food and we're gonna to have to ration our resources and we're gonna to have to be collaborative and share. And when one of us feel like we're not gonna make it out, the rest of us are gonna rally around that individual and let them know that tomorrow is going to be a better day than today. Do a preacher a favor real quick and just look down your row and say, I'm here to encourage you this morning. The goal was from, for them to get to the bottom from the bottom to the top. The goal was for them to get to the depths of where they were, to the top of the world, to surface again, to be alive again, to live again, to have another shot at life. The goal was for them to get to where they were, which looked bleak, which looked like it could not happen, to get back to a source of life and a sense of life and fulfillment and wholeness and a reunion with their loved ones. The goal was for them to get back to the top from the bottom. And I believe this morning in this room, somebody watched online, wherever you're watching, you're about to go from the bottom right to the top. I believe God sent me in here this morning to declare to somebody, get ready to go from the bottom. Let's get some consensus in the room and just say, I'm going from the bottom to the top, baby. And it doesn't matter how high you are. There's no height you can climb. God will take you higher. It doesn't matter. Look at somebody say, I'm about to go from the bottom to the top. <laughs> the Bible says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, 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 not if, not maybe, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Let's unpack that. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. That means if I delay, if I, if, I def if I allow myself to put my hope on the shelf and my expectations at the back seat of my life, then that means it is going to cause an illness, maybe not physical, but certainly emotional and spiritual in my life that I feel like all hope is lost. Therefore, I'll give up on any option of either a rescue or a change in my situation, and I'll begin to perceive that this is the way things are going to be. You always got options to get out. 
The problem with understanding the options is that the middle of any difficulty is usually not pretty. It is horrible. It is ugly. And we miss the chance to chronicle the journey because of the unappealing parts of our story. Therefore, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want nobody to know about it. That means we are deferring our hope. That means that the more we stay silent about the situation because it's ugly means that there's a chance that hope is not being built up on the inside of us so that when the desire comes, it becomes a tree of life to you. In other words, with limited resources based upon your situation, hope then fills in as a gap stop to what you do not have so that you can start focusing on what you do have. In other words, it's never as bad as it looks. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm not saying it's not bad, but I am saying it's never as bad as it looks. There, there, there is this concept, this I ideology around survival uh, that if you're in a surviving mode or mindset and it has a, or bears a negative connotation to it. And so we pit one against the other, either you're surviving or you're thriving. And, and, and we use these little colloquialisms to, to uh, uh, defend our narrative that we are in thriving mode and I'm living my best life and these are the best days of my life. And, and the church is professionals at doing this work. You ought to get an Oscar for the acting that you're doing because we show up to each other and we say, I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. How you doing? I can't, can't get help. How you doing? I am so blessed. Things are so good. Everything is so great. You can't live your life like that every day. There's some up days. There's some down days. There's some difficult days. There's some trying days. Baby, there's some days I don't even want to get out of bed. There's some days. No, have mercy. There's some days. Oh, can I talk to some real people in the room? There are some days where I have a conversation with Jim B. Y'all don't want to talk back to me. And Mr. Hennessy, there are some Oh, oh y'all phony. Let me go talk to this people over here. There are some days when church don't do it for me. Okay, 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 okay. okay. <laughs> Before you say anything, fix the halo. It's a little crooked. It's a little crook. It's a little crooked. It's a little crooked. And because we are lulled into these false narratives of either or, rather than understanding both and, we start feeling bad that we're just surviving. Listen, when you're going through something, the only thing you can do is survive it. I want to talk to some people who are just making it. No, you're just, you're just barely getting by. You're just making it. I don't need any stats to, to articulate to you that the majority of people living in this country are just making it. And I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about emotionally and spiritually. Every day is a fight. Oh, let me find the right group. Just let me find the right group, God. Let me find the right. Every day it's a fight. You go to work and you try to get yourself up. You drink your coffee. You have your tea. You tell yourself, Wusa. Come on, somebody. You parked in a parking lot in your car right outside the office and say, if they say it one more again, if they say one more, one more time, I'm going to lose. Just making it is the basis of hope realized. That means 
that if you're just making it, you have already won. The fact that you got up the next day, uh, put your clothes on and decided I'm going to go means you already won. Somebody got up this morning and said, I ain't going to church. But you got up this morning and you said, you know what, devil? I ain't going to let you have this day. This is the day that the Lord had made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Slap somebody high five and say, I got something to live for. I got dreams and aspirations, and I got plans, and they are detailed, and I got vision. I got something to live for. So if you're just making it, you've already won. Because what I'm really talking about this morning and what I'm really preaching about is not so much survival, even though that's my title, Band of Survivors. What I'm really talking about is what's in the band. Who's in the group? Are there trombones? Are, 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 are there saxophones? Are there trumpets? What, what's in the band? And I have to understand so that when the sound comes that I hear from my band, I know it's time to move. Do, do, do I have an upstart of, of, of things in my band that don't allow me to hear the sound that I need to hear? Do I have the lack of instrumentation that is necessary for me to compose the symphony I'm trying to deliver? What's in my band? Do I have a horn section that's tighter than James Brown horn section? <laughs> or oh, is it melodic like the elements of earth, wind, and fire? <laughs> oh, don't, don't play me up in here. You know who the elements are. You know who the elements are. If I start going into, do you remember? <laughs> to survive means to continue to live or exist in spite of the danger. Whereas to thrive means to grow and to develop and to prosper. We have to stop pitting these two together as if they have to be either or. They are both and because they make up the band. And inside of that band is something deeper. Inside of this gap is something deeper from, from surviving to thriving. And that's what I call striving. That means while I am surviving, I am striving to thrive. I'm doing what is ever necessary. I, 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 am, I am assessing my situation and I'm realizing what do I need at this moment to get to where I need to go. One of the miners who were trapped down below realized their greatest necessity was water. Because, because without water, without water, <laughs> you can't survive. You, you can live without food for up to 40 days, but without water, you, you can only survive for about, for about three. So water is life. And so what they had to do, first point, what they had to do was accept the situation. If you're going to discover what's in your band, the first thing you got to do is accept the situation. Now, what do I mean by acceptance? I, I mean that acceptance is it's not, a, it's not a dirty word. It bears no negative connotation because you have to understand denial doesn't heal anything. The more you deny is the more you delay.
And if you don't look at your situation, whatever it may be, good, bad, or ugly, and accept what it is, it means that when you accept it, you fully acknowledge the facts of the situation without fixating on how it shouldn't be that way. I don't deserve this. They shouldn't have did me like that. You don't have time to fixate on the fact that it shouldn't be that way because it is that way. It's a mindset that moves you away from the often harsh judgment of yourself and allows you to break away from the thoughts of guilt and unfairness. Acceptance is a powerful tool. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, First Peter said it this way. He said, I like the message Bible. First Peter said, in First Peter 5 and 6, he said, be content with who you are. Don't put on any airs because God's strong hand is already on you. Acceptance allows you to see and to determine what is the most vital thing that you need in this moment. It most importantly allows you not to be gaslit by anybody. If you're not familiar with the term gaslit, it actually comes from the film and the entertainment industry because but there was a movie uh, starring Ingrid Bergman where her husband was a powerful uh, individual and he would do something and then she would see it and, and, and then he would convince her that it didn't happen. So much so that it drove her to insanity. In other words, it wasn't me. Oh, y'all don't know that, that language from, okay, y'all don't understand what I'm So you do something wrong, you mess up, and then you convince somebody who respects you and looks up to you that what happened didn't happen. <laughs> Come on, stay with me, stay with me. To gaslight someone means to manipulate another person into doubting their own perceptions their own experiences or their own understanding of truth. When you can be gaslit, it can happen from a romantic partner, it can happen from a family member, it can happen uh, from a politician, it can happen from a doctor, it can happen from anybody who has perceived power or, or an articulation over a situation to convince you that what you think, what you perceive, what you see is not the real truth of what's going on and makes you feel crazy about your interpretation of the situation as if you didn't see what what you saw. I'm a mess with some people. I saw those Roman eyes. I saw them. I saw them. I saw them. I saw you flirt with, with that person. I saw it. I saw. No, I would. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't flirt. I didn't. Uh. Gaslighting. It's a powerful thing, and what we have to understand in our world today in the maddening of this society, of where we find ourselves, this wilderness, we're all being gaslit. Everywhere you turn, from social media, to the news, to our conversations, we're just talking about how horrible it is. Child, I'm just trying to make it. And even when there are inklings of hope, the conversations that we have around opportunities usually lack hope within the conversation. That somehow, some way, we're going to get back to a negative perception of what the reality is. Yes, it might be horrible, but perhaps, perhaps, something good just might come out of this. Uh, 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 
<laughs> Don't go so fast. You have to realize if you can change your narrative, you can change your life. The reason I'm telling you that is because what is really truly under siege today is perception. Perception is the thing that is completely and totally under siege and it's easier now because we all just went through a traumatic experience of feeling trapped together. So now it is easy to warp our perceptions to make us feel like, think like all hope is lost, that things are not going to change, that things are not going to turn around, and to make us feel like, what's the use? I have a term for it. It's, it's, actually, it's actually my second point. There's a term for it. Don't worry, I'm going to get to the text in a second. There's a term for it, and it means, to, uh, it means automatic judgment. In other words, you have to learn how to avoid automatic judgments. There's a wonderful story uh, about a farmer uh, who, who had his only horse, and his only horse ran away. And his neighbor came over to console him, saying, we are very so sorry for your horse. Uh, this has to be horrible news, and you must feel angry and sad about it. And the farmer looked back and said, well, we'll see. Who can know what's good or what's bad? The next week, the farmer's horse returned, and, and when it returned, it came back with a dozen wild stallions following behind. And the farmer and his son wrangled the horses up, and his neighbor uh, uh, commented, wow, you got good fortune. You must be blessed. You must be uh, uh, joyful the, the way you feel that your horse returned. And, and the farmer just simply replied, well, we'll see. Who knows what's good and what's bad? The, the next day, the next day, uh, 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 the, 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 the farmer returned uh, uh, to, to his normal doings, uh, uh, but the country went to war, and, 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 and every healthy young man was drafted to the fight. But there's something that happened. The horses that all came back trampled on his son and broke his leg, and therefore his son didn't have to go to the war because his leg got trampled on and got broken. And so the neighbor came on and said, you must feel great because this is going to be a horrible war and your son is going to be home with you. And the farmer said, we'll see. <laughs> the power of perception. Let me give you scripture reference for it. As a man thinks... In his heart, so is he. Let me give you another spiritual example, scriptural example. There, there, there was, there was a, a woman uh, who had a relationship uh, out of sowing and blessing the man of God, Elisha. And, and Elisha wanted to bless her. And he said, what can I give you? And as a matter of fact, she said, you know what, I'm good. I'm, I'm all right. Because... The perception of not being able to produce a child so weighed on her, she didn't even want to ask for it. And so he says, no, what can I give you? And it was the servant that said to, to Elisha, she is without child. And Elisha went and told her, you're, you're going to have a child. And she said, don't play with me. Don't play with my emotions. Don't play with my feelings. Don't. Come on, son. don't play with me. Don't play. Don't do. Don't do it. Don't don't play. Play. Don't play. Don't do it. Don't play with my emotions. I, I I can't deal with the heaviness of that loss of wanting something so bad and not being able to have it. Well, lo and behold, she had a child and 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 he, she was able to raise him. But one day, this child fell ill, dead in the hot sun, and she took him back home and laid him on the bed. And the Bible says that this woman got up on the Lord's day and got before the Lord's day and got dressed. And her husband said to her, where are you going like that? It's, it's not even the Lord's day. And she says, I'm going to go and see the man of God. And while Elijah was up on the top of the mountain, he, Gehazi said, hey, there, there's the woman that, that you blessed with the son. And, and he says, go see if it's well with her. And Gehazi yelled down and said, hey, is it well with you? Oh! Her situation was that her son was home dead. And Gehazi said, hey, how you doing? Is it well with you? 
how's your husband? Is it well with him? She said, it's well with him. And, 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 and she says, hey, is it well with you? She said, it's well with me. And then he said, is it well with your son? She said, it's well with my soul. You got to shift your perception of the situation and not allow the horror of the situation to get down into the depths of your soul. Somebody shout, it is well. Now, 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 I gotta go, go, I gotta go quickly, I gotta go quickly because in this text is the battle for perception. And, and when I first read it and God gave it to me, I thought to myself, Hezekiah, I'm sorry to use this term, it's kind of crass, Hezekiah, you punking out, man. The king of Assyria is on a war path against Jerusalem. And he has already captured and conquered all of the allies that are around Jerusalem, and they ain't nobody left. Hezekiah feels trapped. And so the king of Assyria, this, this is some boss stuff, the king of Assyria sends a letter. <laughs> Not a messenger, which is normal during that time, but a letter so that they can read it. No, oh, have mercy. And to read the letter and let them know, I'm coming, I'm going to take your stuff, I'm going to take everything. It is what it is. And Hezekiah read the letter, and I thought he capitulated to the letter because he said, sent back to uh, uh, the king of Assyria, all right, let me give you some tribute, let me give you some money, and then you won, just, just let me be how I'll be. And, and when I read that, I said, how dare you just give up like that? But the more I realized it, I realized he wasn't capitulating, he was accepting. He knew I can't fight him with my strength. So I'm gonna buy me some time. And let him know, I'll give you some tribute if you chill out. And when that happened, the king of Assyria Stop coming towards Jerusalem and got focused on another city and, and kept his, 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 his fight there. Now, he was still coming, but he wasn't coming as fast. And so then, Lord have mercy, the word of the Lord comes to, the, to Hezekiah and, and, and Isaiah comes to him and he says to him, listen, God is going to deal with the enemy who is trying to take you out. Allow me to paraphrase. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And then he comes and lets him know, as a matter of fact, because you have accepted the fact that this is not your fight, and you realize the power of your perception by not making an automatic judgment that you're going to lose, I got some more word for you. And the word is this. This is going to be a sign for you. This year, you're going to eat what grows. So despite the fact that the siege is coming, and all hell is breaking loose, you're still going to prosper. Come on, stay with me. Who am I talking to? Despite the fact of the stories they're telling us, you're still going to make it. He says, so you're going to eat the fruit in the first year, and then in the second year, you're going to eat the fruit of, of, of what came out of what you ate, and you're going to survive off of that. But in the third year, I'm going to accelerate you when you come out of this. 
Slap somebody a high five and say, God's about to accelerate you when you come out of this. The story we orient ourselves to and ourselves in this world is powerful. The story is how we figure out and bring order to meaning of the events all around us. It's the story that we hold to ourselves, that we tell ourselves, that's going to get us through every situation. So what story are you telling yourself? Is it a political narrative? Is it an injustice narrative? Is it a victimhood narrative? What story are you telling yourself? Sorry, let me give it to you in biblical vernacular. Whose report do you believe? I don't know about you, but I believe the report of the Lord. And his report says I'm healed from the crown of my head to the soul of my feet. His report says I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed when I come and blessed when I go. And I got to hurry up. I got to hurry up. I got to hurry up. So, so, so now that there is this acceleration because of the acceptance of the situation and the avoidance of, 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 of the judgments, of the automatic judgments that we typically give to any situation and circumstance, now all of a sudden there is this acceleration. I, I think I need to give you more imagery to understand this concept because it, it, in order to understand what I'm talking about, you have to change your perception. When we, when we hear about the parable of the workers and, and, and Jesus telling this story, and he tells this story uh, about an owner uh, of a vineyard that goes out and get workers at four different hours of the day. And, and, and so he gets the first group of workers and he, he agrees to terms to pay them a certain wage. And he goes out later in the day and gets another set of workers and agrees to pay them the same thing he was paying the first workers. And then later in the day, again, he goes out and gets more workers and pay them the same thing he pays the first workers and the second workers. And then in the ninth hour, the latest part of the day, he goes and gets more workers and pay them the same thing. If we look at this with a linear perception, I, I, I just need a few people for a second. I need about four or five brothers real quick. Come up here real quick. Come on, come on, come on. Do it fast because I ain't got that much time. Come on real quick. Matter of fact, just come up on stage so everybody can see it real quick. Just four or five brothers. Just four or five. There we go. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stand, just stand in a, in a straight line toward me. Thank you very much. If we view this concept in a linear perception uh, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first because that's how we view that text. That means that this person who should go first now all of a sudden is last. The first thing that you say is that ain't fair especially if it's you. I was skipped over. They don't like me. They hate me. That's how we view it. But that story is not made to be viewed in a linear, perceptive manner. Stand in a circle. Now, turn around so you can face everybody. There you go. Yeah, you're going to face the, the screen. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm helping your perception. Can I take time to do this? I'll preach in a second. Just let me do this. So, so watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. So now, now, when we say the first shall be last and the last shall be first, how can you tell? Who's first or who's last? Because the reality is they all got the same thing. Now go ahead and turn. Just turn real slow. Just, just turn in a circle. Just turn. Like ring around the rosy. Like musical chairs. Come on, come on. Just turn. Just, come on, come on, sir. You, yeah, hang it. Come on. 
Come on. Come on. Come on. It's your turn. You about to get blessed. Keep going. It's your turn. You about to get blessed. Come on. It's your turn. It's your turn. And it's your turn. Wait a second. Everybody got blessed. Slap somebody a high five and say, baby, I think it's my turn. I dare you just to go to Turner and shout, it's my turn. Look, every time I turn around, God is... Oh, I dare you get it down in your spirit. Shout, it's my turn, it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn for promotion. It's my turn for healing. It's my turn for breakthrough. It's... So now, if we can perceptually understand this concept of acceleration, then we can understand that we're truly never trapped. I was, I, I, I had got, I was, I was much younger. I was much younger when I tell a story, so don't judge me. I was much younger and, and I got this job and they asked me on the application, can you drive a stick? And I was like, I sure can. Ask me, can I drive a stick? You must be crazy. I drive. That's my first car was a stick. I know how to. And the truth was, I could drive one, sort of. <laughs> so first day on the job, they, they give me this vehicle, and they said, we need you to take this from here to here, and they're going to give you another vehicle, and you're going to bring that back. I said, no problem. I'm like 20 years old, 21. And, and, and you know, I, some of y'all know my story. Listen, I had just got out of jail. Y'all don't want to talk about that. I needed this job. Y'all don't want to talk about it. Huh? Y'all want to talk back to me. Y'all want to talk back to me. I, I, was, uh, I listened here. I needed this job. So that's right. I lied on the application. So, 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 so they give me the car. And it's, 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 it's January on the East Coast, and there's ice and snow everywhere. And to get out of where I needed to get out, there was this massive hill. So I get in the car, and I look at it, I say, it's a stick shift. And I just started ripping gear. <laughs> And I get the thing in reverse, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I get it backed out, and, 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 I, and I, get, I say, all right, get it to first. You get it to first, you be all right. All right, if you get it to first, you can get out the parking lot. Once you get out the parking lot, if you get it to third, you can make it all the way to wherever you need to go. It's going to be slow, but you're going to get there. And so I got it out. I got it in first, and I'm driving, and, and I see this hill. and there's snow and ice on the hill. And I get up the hill and I go, God, if you love me. If you truly love me, you will not allow any other cars to come on this hill. As soon as I was saying that, two cars come right up behind me. I'm like, the devil is a liar. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, all right. You, you're going to have to press on this gas, son, because if, if you don't, you're going to stall out, and you're going to slide back on this hill. And I'm just vroom, 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 and ain't going nowhere. And, and, and there's two cars behind me, and I don't have any other option. And so the light changes. I hit the accelerator. And I jerk forward, and I conquer, conquer, clunk my way onto the next street, which is to, to the on-ramp and to the highway. And I, I get it in second enough, 
and then I get it in third, and I'm like, I'm good, I'm in third. I, 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 I'm going to make it. And I get on the off-ramp, and, and as soon as I get off, there's this huge truck coming down, and I got to wait for him to pass me and go around him, and I go around him, and he slows down for some reason. And so now I'm driving next to him, and, and he's right looking at me, and I'm just... <laughs> and the gears are, are stalling because it's time for me to shift, and I'm too afraid to shift because I don't know if I shift if I'm going to make it to my destination. So I guess the trucker got tired of listening to this awful noise. He rolls his window down, and I am already trying to pay attention, and he's honking his horn and doing the toot-toot thing, and I'm like, what, man? I roll my window down. I'm like, what's up? Tell you, any, any, any trucker you could imagine, I hate to use stereotypes, and, and had, and had this, this checkered shirt on, and he had the, you know, had stuff in his, in his drum right here, uh, right there, right, right around there, you understand? And he was talking like this right here, I can't get help from nobody. And as he, he was talking, he looked down over at me, and he said, shift, dummy! <laughs> you might feel stuck, you might feel trapped, but you got the power to shift dummy. Somebody got to shift. Somebody got to shift. I dare you to give God 30 seconds of crazy praise and say I'm shifting my perception. Shift, 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 shift. Shift, 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 shift. Now let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. Let me finish. The text is a battle of perception. The king of Assyria wants to have perceived power over the situation. So much so that Hezekiah decides he is going to have men to start building a tunnel because of the perceived siege. In other words, the only fresh water supply for the survival of the army on the outside is also on the outside of Jerusalem walls. It's called the Gihon Spring. And so Hezekiah decides we have to cut them off circumcision. We have to cut them off. We have to cut them off. We have to cut them off from the only thing that will give us survival. If they get to the fresh water supply, then they're going to be able to be revived and replenished while we're not. So let's dig a tunnel. It's called Hezekiah's Tunnel. And it's beneath the city of Jerusalem, the city of David. And he issues two sets of men to start digging on each side of the tunnel. And one group is digging at the wall, and the other group is digging at the pool of Siloam, which, is, which, is, which is, has so much prophetic indication that I don't have time to go into. Because it was at the pool of Siloam that Jesus healed a man who was blind. And he put uh, mud in his eye and told him, go wash it in the pool of Siloam. Why? Because it was all about his perception. And so, and so two men are working, two crews are working. One crew is working on one side and the other crew is working on the other side. Now, I'm going to have to use that mic for, for a second because, because I don't know if I can hold and contain myself. I'm trying to be cute, y'all, but I don't know if I can hold and contain myself about this point because while they are digging, much like the, the engineers were digging out the Chilean miners, the Chilean miners didn't know what was going on on the outside and the diggers didn't know what was going on on the inside. <laughs> Hezekiah's men who were digging in the tunnel didn't even know what was happening on the outside. And the king of Assyria on the outside had no idea what was happening on, on the inside. 
Oh God, what are you trying to say, Pastor? I, I'm trying to say to you that, that there is a perception of what's happening on the outside, but there is also a perception of what's happening on the inside. On the inside, I'm trying to survive, but on the outside, I'm trying to thrive. And in between, I am striving to make it until it's all over. So while I'm striving, I got to be strong and of good carriage. Why? Because God is going to handle everything that's happening on the outside. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. I said God is going to take care of everything that's happening on the outside. While the men were digging, the Lord told Hezekiah, you can keep digging all you want to, but I am about to take the king of Assyria out. He sent an angel of the Lord down to the king of Assyria's camp. And 185 thousand of the soldiers were taken out overnight. But I'm still digging in the tunnel. I don't even know that the battle was over. I don't even know that there ain't even no fight no more. I don't even know that God has already taken care of it, but I'm still swinging my axe. I'm still dead. Slap your neighbor high five and say, keep swinging, baby, keep swinging. I know it feels like you're going to lose something, but keep swinging. I know it feels like you ain't going to make it, but keep swinging. I know it feels like you're not going to get the breakthrough that you want, but keep swinging. Oh God, thank you, Holy Ghost. You know why you got to keep swinging? Because I just heard the Lord say, even if you lose it, you're going to get it back. I don't know who this is for, but even if you lose it, you're going to get it back. I don't have time for that. There, there, there was a man that was cutting down some trees to build a house of the prophets, and he lost his axe head, and it went in the water, and he went and got Elijah, and he said, Master, I owe. And Elijah said, tell me where you lost it. I don't know who it's for, but I hear the Lord say, tell me where you lost it, because you're about to get it back. Who am I talking to in this room? I dare you to open your mouth and accept the situation and tell God where you lost it because you are about to get it back. Somebody slap somebody a high five and say, get it back, get it back, get it back. Your peace, your joy, your energy, your vitality, get it back. Strength is coming into your spirit right now. Get it back, get it back, get it back. Back, get it. I dare you to get audacious and say, I'm gonna get everything the enemy thought he stole from me. The Bible says, if the thief be found, he's got to restore to you sevenfold and the increase of his house. Somebody shall get it. Can I go just a little bit deeper, real quick, real quick? Somebody shout, get it back, get it back, get it back. Get it back, 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 get it back. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Wait a second. It dawned on me that Hezekiah had enough wisdom to protect the Gihon Spring because Gihon means gushing. The prophetic significance of this moment is this. The king of Assyria is coming to assert himself on the throne of Jerusalem. And Hezekiah knows enough history 
like the history of the story I just told you of the Chilean miners to be reminded of what's at stake. In other words, every now and then you got to look back over your history and realize if it didn't take you out then, what made you think it's going to take you out now? Oh, I feel like preaching. I dare you to look at somebody and say, I'm still here. Oh, God, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Shut I'm still here. Bruised, but I'm still here. Bleeding, but I'm still here. Bludgeoned, but I'm still here. Torn, but I'm still Oh, God. So, 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 Hezekiah has enough sense to understand this prophetic moment. He realizes, huh, I cannot let the king of Assyria get to the fresh water supply because the water is the very means of our survival. And if I let him get our flow, then we will never know if we're going to make it. More importantly, the Gihon is always significant of the anointing because this is where Solomon was anointed as king over all of Israel, which would continue the messianic line, come on somebody, so that the king of kings can teach us in his final, final act that it's never truly over until he says it's over. And so, could it be what the enemy really wants is for you to perceive that you are not anointed and that you are undeserving of the blessings that are to come <laughs> and that you are never going to achieve or accomplish or step into the next shift in your life that keeps you up at night because you know on the depths of your inside that what is happening is not it. Something else is about to take place. But everything on the outside is trying to convince you that it's not going to happen. But the Holy Ghost woke me up this morning to tell somebody in this room, just keep on swinging because it's about to flow in your life. There's about to be a gushing of the goodness of God flowing in your life. So, at one moment, the men who were chiseling and tunneling and following the fissures in the wall in the darkness of the night, not knowing that the battle was already won. Because I'm still swinging and doing my part. And I don't even know that God had already gave me the victory. I just know I got to protect this anointing. And I can't let the devil have my praise. And I can't let the devil have my preaching. I can't let the devil have my gift. And I can't let the devil have my purpose. And I can't let the devil have my calling. He's after your anointing. Because it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. And the anointing is not a feeling, it's a knowing. Ain't no button you get up here and push and say, oh, let me hit the anointing button. You know you're anointed because of the battles that you went through and from the scars that you bear and the crushings that you have endured. I dare you to get audacious and say, I know I'm anointed, baby. I know I got power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. While I'm digging, there is a complete annihilation of the enemy on the outside. Oh God. While I'm walking through it, God is strategizing on how to take care of my enemies. A thousand might fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but in reality, none of it really came nigh me. It was in proximity, but it wasn't. Watch this. Watch 
this, watch this. And so at night, with just fires, lamps, you got a lamp in one hand, and you got a chisel in the other, because these are all the materials you got. You're just trying to survive. But you're so bent on thriving that you keep striving through the night. And so you got your torch. And make sure I don't burn myself. I got to get there. And I'm getting tired. And, and, but the reality is, you ain't by yourself. Because the person behind you is doing the same thing. And I hear one of them say, won't you go ahead and rest a while? I'll take it from here. I dare you to look at your neighbor and say, won't you go ahead and rest in the goodness of God? I'll praise them for you. I'll lift them up for you. I'll give them glory for you. I know you're tired, but I got you. I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus. He is your battle axe. He is your provider. He is your peace. He is your healer. He is your way maker. He's your will in the middle of a week. I dare somebody go ahead and praise him for the person next to you and say, I know you're tired, but I'm going to keep on swinging. I'm not just swinging for me. I'm also swinging for you. I dare you turn around and find somebody and say, I'm going to keep on swinging. This one for your kids and this one's for your child and this one's for your family. This one for that situation that you can't tell nobody. I'm going to keep on swinging. I'm going to keep on giving them glory. I dare you to lift them up. I dare you to give them praise. I dare you to take 30 seconds and start swinging glory all around the room. I dare you to give them glory. Come on, 20 more seconds. Somebody's getting a breakthrough. Come on, lift them up. Come on, give them glory. 15 more seconds. Somebody's getting set free. Prayers are being answered. I dare you to give him glory. Shout like you believe it. Shout like it's already done. And so, there is an inscription called the inscription of the tunnel. And in the inscription, they write their story. And in their story, they realize that they didn't know that somebody was digging on the other side they just thought the people who were on this side was all they had and they didn't know that there was a whole nother crew digging on the other side and so when they got down to the last little bit of bedrock they heard a sound of voices and noise and they begin to look around and say, was that you? I think God's about to do something in your life that's going to make you look around and go, who was that? Where that come from? How that happened? How could it be? Who was that over there? And all of a sudden, they heard a voice from the other side. And they said, who's that over there? And they said, it's us. And they said, you've been digging? And they said, we've been digging too. There's one little bit of rock left. And if you swing, and I swing, we're going to break through the hole. If 
you swing and I swing, we gonna break through the... I dare you to find somebody to swing with and shout, if you swing and I swing, we about to break through the hole. I dare you to swing. I dare you to. Once you get through, just pull them by the head and say, We're coming out together. We're coming out together. We're coming out together. Grab your neighbor by the hand and grab that hand and say, we're coming out together. Y'all ain't serious. I dare you to grab somebody and go to praising God and say, we're coming out. Everybody's making it out alive. Everybody's making it out alive. Grab that neighbor one more time and say, we're coming out together. Yeah, somebody shout, yeah. Shout, I'm out. I'm out of depression. I'm out of heartache. I'm out of failure. I'm out of lack. For God is about to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. I'm out. I'm out. Let somebody hop out say, I'm out, baby, I'm out, I'm out. I'm all the way out. I'm all the way out. My anointing is intact. My perception is intact.
I want to tell a personal story. Just when I moved here, when I moved here, I had a great ministry. 158,000 square foot building, $30 million in renovation, debt free. I had a great organization. And I came to talk to our bishop about acquiring more land and expanding it because there was a shift in my life that I knew that what I was doing wasn't it. But there's a part of the story that I hide and I masquerade because the truth of the matter is I was miserable. I didn't have it all together. I started a ministry to fulfill a dream of a dead man. I was with my father the day he saw that building that I built my church in. I was 10 years old. He died when I was 12. And I made it my purpose to fulfill his dream. So that when I did, I wasn't fulfilled. Because it wasn't my dream. It was his. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. So I was depressed, tired, unsure of myself. I lost my confidence. And this man, <laughs> this man has the audacity to just keep putting me on out there. <laughs> you be all right. Okay. And And we were in Orlando, Florida. And he was telling me about this uh, physiologist individual. And he said, man, you ought to go see this person there, fabulous. And they got these, this technology that tells you all about your body. And you should check it out. So I made an appointment. And I went. He didn't tell me how much it was, though. He didn't tell me. <laughs> you know, when you hang out, you, anyway, I ain't going to talk about it. He thought that much of me that he thought I could go and, uh, <laughs> and afford the fee. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I get there, and the lady is looking at me. I haven't got on one piece of instrument. I see the infrared lights. I see all the stuff and the technology. I haven't done anything. She's just staring at me. And she says, tell me what happened to your right leg. I said, what? She said, what happened to your right leg? I said, how did you know something's wrong with my right leg? She says, you lean that way. I said, I was in a car accident and the lower half of my body got caught underneath the dash. The upper torso of my body went through the windshield. I had two surgeries. They told me I'd never walk again. I got a rod in here and all that, all that stuff. I told a story. She said, that's not the major problem. I said, that's not the major problem? <laughs> she says, no. She says, the bigger problem is this. How long have you been shrinking to fit the size of other people's opinion? <laughs> I wasn't no more good. I'm a grown behind man, but I lost it that day. I was just crying and weeping because my body 
started to take on the deformity. of everybody else's perception. She said, you're much bigger than you realize. And so I pose the same question to you. How long have you been shrinking to accommodate other people's perception of you. You are much bigger.